Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. This is Lisa Whitehead, and we are studying Anatomy and Physiology 1 at Illinois Central College. Today, we're going to cover Chapter 17, The Special Senses. The learning outcomes for this unit are rather lengthy. I'm going to go through all of them anyway with you because I know that your time is limited and valuable and you need to be able to focus on certain material properly and to spend your time wisely. So let's discuss what we need to do at the end of this unit. The outcomes include to describe the structure and function of the accessory visual structures, to discuss the mechanism of image formation on the retina, to identify the structural components of an eye, and to define the following terms. These are all eye-related terms. The eyelids, palpebra, conjunctiva, sclera, cornea, lacrimal glands, and lacrimal apparatus, the choroid, ciliary body, iris, pupil, retina, rods, cones, the optic disc, macula lutea, bovia centralis, lens, suspensory ligaments, aqueous and vitreous humors, and photoreceptors. Also, to discuss the importance of pupillary and convergence reflexes, to discuss accommodation versus convergence, acuity, and astigmatism, to explain the difference between the rods and cones with respect to visual perception and retinal localization, and to state the importance of an ophthalmoscopic examination. Also, to define the following terms, blind spot, after image, accommodation, the near point of accommodation, visual acuity, astigmatism, color blindness, rod and cone positioning, binocular vision, convergence, photopupillary re reflex, and ophthalmoscopic exam, to identify the anatomic structures of the external, middle, and inner ear, to describe the anatomy of hearing, including the organ of corti, and to explain its function in sound reception, to describe the anatomy of equilibrium organs and to explain their function, to state the purpose of the Weber, Rinne, Barony, and Romberg tests, to describe the effects of acceleration on the semicircular canals, to explain the role of vision in the maintenance of equilibrium, you may have noticed at this point that some of these objectives are going to be covered in the lab and not just the lecture, but this is for both the lecture and lab unit. So it also includes to be able to define the following terms about the ear. The oracle or pinna, the external acoustic meatus or external auditory canal, the tympanic membrane or eardrum, ossicles, the malleus, incus, and stapes, the oval window, the pharyngeotympanic tube or auditory or eustachian tube, the vestibule, semicircular canals, the round window, endolymph, paralymph, the cochlea, and the scala vestibuli and tympani, and the cochlear duct. We'll also be looking at hearing tests and examinations. This is largely in the lab. The otoscope, acuity, localization, using an audiometer, also looking at frequency, conduction, perception, and the Rinne and Weber tests. You'll also be doing equilibrium tests in the lab. This includes the Romberg and Barony tests. We'll look at nystagmus and vertigo. You'll be able to recognize various types of various sensory receptors as studied in the lab and to describe the function and location of each type. To demonstrate and relate differences in relative density and distribution of tactile and thermal receptors in the skin. To define tactile localization and describe how this ability varies in different areas of the body and to explain the tactile two-point discrimination test. Lastly, to describe the location and cellular composition of the olfactory epithelium, to describe the structure and function of the taste receptors, to name the four basic types of taste sensation and list the chemical substances which elicit these sensations, to explain the interdependence between the senses of smell and taste, to name factors other than olfaction which influence our appreciation of foods, and lastly, to define papilla, gustation, a taste pore, olfactory epithelium, and olfactory adaptation. So in today's lecture, we're going to be discussing these special senses. This includes the sense of olfaction, which is also known as smell, or gustation, which is the sense of taste. We will discuss vision, and then in our ears, we'll both discuss equilibrium and balance and hearing. So essentially, all of our special senses are located in our heads and nowhere else in our body. Today's lecture, like all of our lectures, will go through the textbook in order, so that way you can follow along in your text if you like, or take a break as you see fit. So we're going to go through first and look at olfaction, then we'll move into gustation, 
Following that, we'll discuss vision and eye protection structures, and then we'll take that information and build upon it to look at how an image is actually formed. Then we'll look at a more closer in-depth look at photoreceptors. And finally, we will wrap up a discussion of equilibrium and hearing. In general, our sense of olfaction is our sense of smell. And the only place in our body we can smell is through our olfactory organs, which is located in our nasal cavity on both sides of our nasal septum. And the septum is the wall that separates the two nostrils as the openings proceed up into our head. And then again, that drops down into our pharynx. So our olfactory organs are going to be comprised of two separate layers. The first is going to be our olfactory epithelium, and this is the functional component. And then we always have a supportive component to pretty much everything that we do in our body that's specialized. And in this case, the supportive structure is a lamina propria. When we look at our olfactory sense in a little more close detail, we'll find that that olfactory epithelium that's really the business end of our olfactory sense. So the olfactory epithelium will have olfactory sensory neurons that are really just highly modified nerve cells that have dendritic fibers that extend to be able to sense all sorts of different smells. So these will detect dissolved chemicals as they interact with odorant binding proteins. So basically, in effect, these are chemoreceptors. So these olfactory sensory neurons also have supporting cells nearby. And these supporting cells are important for all sorts of reasons. And we also have basal epithelial cells, which are stem cells, which help to turn over new cells as they need replication. We also have our underlying lamina propria. So this is our supporting tissue. And in that supportive tissue, we have areolar tissue, also blood vessels, of course, and nerves. And we also have olfactory glands, and these will secrete mucus, which is going to be very important in terms of providing some protection for those extensive olfactory nerve fibers. Before we go any further, I'd like to review with you figure 17.1 from your text, because this lays out the general structure of our olfactory sense before we go too further into detail. So first off, let's look at the biggest part of this image is going to be the pink epithelium, which is our olfactory epithelium that is up inside our nose on both sides of our head, right? So this olfactory epithelium has up at the top of it, you can see those yellow branches sticking out. Those are dendritic branches of our olfactory nerve fibers extending from the olfactory bulb. And you can see the olfactory bulb is right up in our CNS and it extends with those olfactory nerve fibers. Those actually extend right through some bony tissue that's called the cribriform plate. And then those fibers extend through that bone into the epithelium inside our nose so they can directly sense any type of chemical change. So those olfactory nerve fibers will send information via action potentials through the olfactory bulb, through the olfactory tract, and then directly into the central nervous system, which we'll discuss later. But for now, this is the overall view that you need to be able to understand before we discuss more stuff. Now let's look at figure 17.1 part B and look at a little more detail how this works. So first off, let's orient ourselves to this image. If you look at the very bottom of the image, you're going to see those dendritic branches sticking out at the very bottom. And what they're doing is they are sensing those little purple dots at the bottom, which is supposed to be indicating an odorant or something that is actually being smelled. So we have those dendritic branches that attach up to the dendritic bulb, which is at the bottom of the dendrite of the olfactory sensory neuron. And so you can see in blue, those are the olfactory sensory neurons. They've got their big nuclei in the center and they are interspersed in between supporting cells of the olfactory epithelium. So that gives a little more bulk and space and of course all sorts of other good things like nutrients and gas exchange, all that oxygen and nutrients and then waste removal is able to be supported by those supporting cells right next to the olfactory sensory neurons. So those olfactory sensory neurons then are going to send information up. You can see where it's yellow up at the very top. That's where they're combining together, forming olfactory nerve fibers, and that goes through the cribriform plate, which is bony, up to the olfactory bulb. Now, in the very center of the image, you're going to see that brownish tan area, and that's an olfactory gland that's right in the middle in between everything else. So how do we actually smell something? 
Well, olfactory reception is basically going to start as soon as we have an odorant, which is something that is able to be smelled. And it could be either water soluble or it could be lipid soluble. But that will bind to a G protein and it's a coupled receptor. And so when this happens, it creates a generator potential or a depolarization. And so that helps move things towards the process of generating an action potential. So our olfactory pathways are afferent fibers, right? Sensory afferent, motor efferent. And they leave the olfactory epithelium and they collect into a group of 20 or more bundles like we just saw in that last image. And they penetrate upwards through the cribriform plate, which is of the ethmoid sinus. So that's the bony area. And then it reaches the olfactory bulbs of the cerebrum. And that's where the very first synapse occurs in olfactory reception. Figure 17.2, which is part of a spotlight two page spread in your text, shows you the general process of how olfaction works. So you can see that if a stimulus occurs, creating a generator potential, if it's adequate to reach threshold, then you can see that we have a number of action potentials fire in rapid succession until the stimulus is removed. At which point, because we still have that generator potential, there still may be an action potential as there's a little bit of a lag time here. But then you're going to see that because the stimulus has been removed, there is no more further generator potential and then it returns back down beyond, sorry, below threshold level and therefore no additional action potentials will be created. Afferent fibers are going to carry sensory information starting at our olfactory epithelium and then they collect together into bundles of maybe even 20 or more. Then those together collectively go through the cribriform plate, which is part of the ethmoid bone, and then they reach the olfactory bulbs. There is one on the right and one on the left, and these are in the cerebrum, and that's where the very first synapse will occur. So it's worth noting that because they travel along from the olfactory tract, the olfactory cortex, hypothalamus, and limbic system, that we have an emotional response to things that we smell. Our limbic system is very involved in this process. And our olfactory sense is the only one that has information that reaches the cerebral cortex directly without any relay through the thalamus. At a closer chemical level, here's how that sense of smell works. So first off, you can see in section one here that you can see an odorant molecule will bind with a receptor protein, and that is right next to an inactive G protein. But when that odorant molecule binds, that activates the G protein, which is allowing ATP to be transferred into CAMP. So because of this, now the CAMP, when it's active, will basically open up a sodium ion channel. So then we have sodium rush in. And when that happens, that will create a depolarization. If that depolarization is adequate to reach threshold, then an action potential will be triggered. And then that information gets sent to the central nervous system. Our sense of smell is pretty profoundly interesting. So we can detect between 2,000 to 4,000 different chemical stimuli and discriminate between these differences. Now, we have to compare ourselves with other species because it's worth noting that dogs have a capacity to smell things way better than we do. In fact, 72 times more olfactory receptors are present and they have that greater surface area. So because of this, they're able to smell many, many times better than us, up to including up to maybe 10,000 times better than us. I once heard this made into an analogy that was like, if you ever walk into a room and you smell somebody wearing a strong perfume or a strong cologne, if you wanna make the dog analogy to that, that's basically a dog walking into a major sporting arena and being able to smell somebody in particular in that whole arena. So that's how precise their sense of olfaction is. Our olfactory receptors are gonna be replaced frequently. They turn over, but unfortunately, the total number of neurons will decline with age. So that basically means that as we get older, our sense of smell becomes weaker, and therefore we do things like we wanna be able to wear more perfume or more cologne in order to actually smell it. Now let's discuss gustation, or our sense of taste in section 17.2. Gustation, or taste, is what provides us with information about what we taste, about our foods that we eat and the liquids we consume. And this is done by epithelial cells that are taste receptors. So you'll find these taste receptors in taste buds that are distributed throughout our tongue and also, not just in our tongue, in portions of our pharynx and larynx as well. 
So these are associated with a variety of epithelial projections, which are called lingual papilla. And we're going to discuss these in coming slides. But these are located primarily on the surface of your tongue. Humans have four different types of lingual papilla, or papilla on our tongue, that allow us to taste what we eat and what we drink. So what we can see in this image here is the location of roughly where these exist. So first, let's look at the top. We have valet papilla, which are at the top right in the schematic on the right. So valet papilla are going to be these broad-based looking structures that you can see are lined up right at the posterior aspect of the tongue, actually breaking the tongue into the anterior two-thirds and the posterior two-thirds. And in the valet papilla, we have as many as up to even 100 taste buds in each papilla. The next type we have is called a foliate papilla, and foliate meaning like leaves. It has multiple indentations or grooves, and those taste buds are going to be embedded within them. We also have fungiform papillae, and these are more fungus-like, meaning like a mushroom, so they're more broad-based looking. And in the fungiform papilla, they're each going to have about five taste buds in each of them. And then lastly, we have these tall, thin, thready, spindly-looking papilla called filiform papilla. So the filiform papilla are going to provide friction to help us move food around our mouth, but they actually don't have taste buds in them. But you can see, based off of figure 17.3, the location of each of these types of papilla. So the filiform papilla are pretty much everywhere on the anterior two-thirds of our tongue that help us to be able to move food around. We also have the fungiform papilla pretty much everywhere in the anterior two-thirds. You're going to notice the foliate papilla are going to be localized at the sides laterally of our tongue. And then the valiate papilla are going to be at that boundary between the anterior two-thirds and the posterior third, lined up in the shape of a V. Think V for valate. Because our tongue is epithelialized, we're going to have a cell turnover. So we need to have basal epithelial cells, also known as stem cells there, to help replenish and create new cells. So we have gustatory epithelial cells as well. And these will extend microvilli, or these are known as taste hairs, through a taste pore. So the gustatory epithelial cells only survive about 10 days before they're replaced. So you can see why the role of those basal epithelial cells, or stem cells, is very important. These taste buds are going to be innervated by cranial nerves, and they're going to synapse in the solitary nucleus of our medulla oblongata. The information is going to travel to the thalamus and eventually to the gustatory cortex of our insula, which if you recall from earlier chapters, that is actually an area of our cerebrum that is more medial or more midline. We can detect four primary taste sensations, and these are sweet, salty, sour, and bitter. You're probably familiar with that already. Now, you may have seen an image before of a tongue showing you where different parts of your tongue taste things. Now, it's important to know that we have taste buds all over our tongue and that there's no difference in the structure of the taste buds from one place to another. There does appear, however, to be some sort of information and indication that there is a little bit more sensitivity to certain things in certain places. For example, we may detect salty and sweet more on the anterior aspect of our tongue and sour and bitter more on the posterior aspect of our tongue. But do keep in mind that we have taste buds all throughout our tongue and all of our taste buds are able to provide all four of our primary taste sensations. Recently, there have been two additions to our understanding of what humans can taste. So these two additional taste sensations are umami and water. So umami, if you ever watch any cooking shows, is basically that savory, rich taste that you get when you have something like soy sauce or miso or mushrooms. So this savory taste is imparted by glutamate, and it's a characteristic that you'll find in a lot of broths. Water is actually something else that we can detect detect by our water receptors that are present in the pharynx. So there's actually a relationship between our pharynx and the water receptors present there and the secretion of antidiuretic hormone. So there are other physiologic processes that regulate our water balance, but apparently these water receptors in our pharynx actually also play a role in the secretion of antidiuretic hormone. Figure 17.2 reviews how our gustatory epithelial cells respond to different taste stimuli like salt, sour, sweet, bitter, and umami. So what I'd like to draw your attention to here is in the image on the right, you'll see that we have salt and sour channels. So salt channels are going to be the sodium channels, of course, 
And then any sour channels are going to be responding to hydrogen. Now, the sweet bitter and umami receptors have a similar mechanism. And keep in mind, these are distributed throughout our tongue, so we can respond in a variety of ways to these. But also, it's important to note that we respond differently to different tastes. So, for example, we're extremely sensitive to bitter compounds, and we're also extremely sensitive to acid compounds, although not quite as much. Now, sweet, salty, and umami, we're of course also sensitive to, but not as much as bitter and also sour, which is basically acidic. So the reason for this is proposed to be one of survival value, because acids and strong bases can be really damaging to us, and they're present in a number of different things in the world that could poison us. So the idea is that we respond to these very quickly so that we, we don't ingest anything poisonous. Taste sensitivity is highly personal and it really varies considerably from person to person and it also can vary among people throughout their lives in different ways. There are some conditions that are inherited. So for example, if you have sensitivity to phenylthiocarbamide, that can mean that you might think that it tastes bitter, but there are other people who think it doesn't taste like anything. Now, we're not going to be tasting PTC in too many things at all, but it's interesting that there are some compounds that are really closely related to PTC that are going to be found in things like Brussels sprouts, broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, and in general, crucifers. So because this is present in those things, we may actually find that some people really don't like eating broccoli or cauliflower. Not that that's an excuse for your kids not to eat their vegetables. <laughs> But anyway, our taste receptors are going to decline, and they decline like everything does with age, but it starts mostly at age 50. So we start off when we're young, we have about 10,000 taste buds, and then we have them throughout our pharynx, our larynx, and our epiglottis, but they do decrease in number by the time we reach adulthood. It's by age 50, though, that the number really starts declining dramatically, and the wheels start coming off. All right, let's look at section 17.3 vision and eye protection structures. Vision is the one special sense that we rely on more than absolutely anything else. But before we discuss vision and how we detect light and create detailed visual images, let's discuss some of the accessory structures of the eye that are important to allow the eye to be able to actually do things like give us vision. So some of the accessory structures include our eyelids, the superficial epithelium of the eye, and then the lacrimal apparatus. And what these do is to provide protection, lubrication, and support for the eye. Our eyelids, or palpebrae plural, palpebra singular, are just a continuation of skin on our face. So what they do is blink, and as they blink, they're going to keep our eye clean and keep it lubricated. So effectively, they're acting like windshield wipers to keep the eye safe and clean. The palpebral fissure is the space that's going to separate the free margins of both the upper and the lower eyelids. So basically what we're saying when we look at somebody and say that they have big eyes, we're really thinking that they have a large palpebral fissure. <laughs> Anyways, our eyelids are connected at two points, on the medial aspect and the lateral aspect, right? On the medial aspect, that's the medial canthus, and the lateral aspect, that's the lateral canthus. So we call these also the medial angle and the lateral angle, respectively. Our eyelids are circumferentially covered with eyelashes, which are thicker and more robust hairs than other body hairs that we have. And these are just there to help prevent any foreign substances from getting into our eye. There is one exception where we do not have eyelashes at one aspect of our eyelids, and that's at the most medial aspect. So if you look closely at this image, you're going to notice at the very most medial aspect of the eye, you'll see that there's a mass of pink tissue and that's called the lacrimal caruncle. And that area here is going to contain some glands that produce some thick secretions, and those thick secretions are what appears in your eye in the morning that you would typically call sleep in your eye. Now, if we go back to look at the circumferential area around the eye at the eyelid, we have those hairs, our eyelashes, but we also have glands that are associated with those hairs, and those are called tarsal glands. So our tarsal glands are there to secrete a product that's high in lipids, and what that does is just keep our eyelids from sticking together. Our eyes are covered with conjunctiva, which is really a mucous membrane covered with a specialized stratified squamous epithelium. So that is going to stretch out to surface both the eye as well as the inner lining of our eyelids 
up underneath our eyes so it's in direct contact with the eyeball. So the part on the inner surface of the eyelids that's in contact with the eyeball, that's the palpebral conjunctiva. And the conjunctiva that extends over the surface of the eye is called the bulbar conjunctiva. It's also sometimes known as the ocular conjunctiva. So that ocular or bulbar conjunctiva is going to stretch out on the surface of the eye covering the white of your eye, basically. And so that will stretch right up to the point where the cornea is at the edge of it. So clinical correlation for you, you've probably heard of pink eye and the clinical term for pink eye is conjunctivitis, which is where you have an infection of or inflammation of the actual conjunctiva itself. And this can be caused by any number of things, ranging from something like an actual bacterial or viral infection, just to something allergic or even just a chemical or even physical irritation of the conjunctiva. To keep our eyes clean, we produce tears. So it is the lacrimal apparatus that is responsible for producing, distributing, and removing tears from our eyes. So what we're looking at in this image here is the lacrimal gland, which you'll see up at the superior lateral aspect of the eye, and this is our tear gland. So the lacrimal gland will create tears, which then will come onto the surface of the eye, and then they drip across medially, so that way they arrive at the medial angle of the eye, at the inferior lacrimal canaliculus, and they'll be collected in the lacrimal sac, which you can see in lavender right at the very medial aspect of the eye. And then they'll drain down from that lacrimal sac, sorry, lacrimal sac through the nasolacrimal duct. So it's telling you where it's going from and to, from the lacrimal sac to the nose, naso, and deposits the tears in the nasolacrimal duct opening inside the nose itself at the level of the inferior nasal concha. So because of this, this is why when we have tears in our eyes, if it doesn't wash away or drip out of our eyes very quickly, what will happen is the collection of tears will pool in the lacrimal sac and therefore we get a runny nose. So the lacrimal gland is our tear gland that actually produces the tears and it bathes the conjunctival surface to wash away anything irritating. And it's very important to note that these tears actually contain lysozyme, which is an enzyme that's antibacterial. So it helps to keep our eye clean and safe. The fornix is that spot where the palpebral conjunctiva joins the bulbar conjunctiva. And there are about 10 to 12 ducts from the lacrimal gland that the fornix is going to be able to receive. So more specifically, the tears are produced by the lacrimal gland at the superolateral aspect of our eye. And then the tears will drip from the lacrimal gland through the lacrimal gland ducts out to the surface of the eye. Then once they collect at the medial angle of the eye, what they'll do is they'll collect in something called a lacrimal lake, which is really just a lake of tears. Basically it's pooling of tears. And so when that happens, then the tears will then pass through the lacrimal puncta, which is a tiny, tiny little pore that's in the center of the medial angle. And then it'll come through the lacrimal canaliculi or canals. And then you'll see that it arrives at the lacrimal sac, which is in lavender at the most medial aspect of the image. And once it pools in the sac, it will drip down through the nasal lacrimal duct into the nasal cavity, hence the runny nose when we cry. Now that we've discussed the accessory structures of the eye, let's look at the eyeball itself. So our eyes are not absolutely perfectly round. They're a little bit spheroid and a little bit irregular. And what we're looking at here is three different layers of the eyeball wall, first off. So we have the outer layer, which is fibrous. We have a middle layer, which is called the intermediate vascular layer. So hence the clever name, there's vascular supply in that area. It's also called the uvea. And then the inner layer is the retina. There's also, by the way, some orbital fat that's in that area. And this is gonna help to cushion and insulate the outer aspect of the eye. So the eyeball itself is hollow, but it's filled with fluid, and that's what keeps it in its nice spheroid shape. Pardon me, spheroid shape. That's hard to say. <laughs> so anyway, let's look at figure 17.5 on the right. Up at the top, you can see in lavender, that is the anterior cavity, and then occupying the vast majority of the eyeball itself in peach is the posterior cavity. So those two cavities are both filled with fluid, and the anterior cavity is filled with aqueous humor, it's watery, 
And then the posterior cavity, occupying the majority of the eyeball, contains vitreous fluid or vitreous body. The outermost layer of our eye is the fibrous layer, and that fibrous layer is composed of our sclera, the cornea, and then, of course, where they come together, the corneoscleral junction. So the sclera is really what we would call the whites of our eyes. And then the area that's over top of where our iris, which is the colored part of our eyes, and our pupil at the very center, what's right over top of those two things is called our cornea. So it's transparent. And so where the cornea and the sclera join, right around the circumferential aspect of the uh, iris itself, is called the corneoscleral junction or the corneal limbus. In between the fibrous layer and the inner layer, or the retina, is the vascular layer, also known as the uvea. So the vascular layer is that place where we have blood vessels and lymphatics that all supply the tissues of the eye. The vascular layer is really important because it helps to regulate the amount of light that's able to enter the eye. And it also helps to secrete and reabsorb aqueous humor. So that way it can continually be recirculated and recreated. It also helps control the shape of the lens, which is an incredibly important part about focusing. We'll discuss this a little bit later on after we've covered the basic anatomy of the eye. Figure 17.5 is a little bit more complicated, but let's break it down and take a look at it. So we know there are three layers to the eyeball. So let's start on the outside in. Okay, we have our outer fibrous layer. So on the right, you can see about halfway down the page, we have the sclera, which is the white of our eye, right? And then we move inner or more inward and that would be the medial or middle layer also known as the uvea because it is our vascular layer so you can see there are blood vessels growing through that and then the third layer on the innermost aspect of the eyeball is the retina itself now let's look overall in the grand scheme of things we have remember the anterior chamber and the posterior chamber so the anterior chamber is the area that's the very top and you can see that there's the lens, this discoid structure that's going to separate out the anterior chamber from the posterior chamber, which is the vast majority of the eyeball itself. And you can see we're pointing out the visual axis. We're gonna discuss that coming up later, so don't worry about that big yellow pointing structure down the center of the image. For now though, let's just talk about some of the other structures that are present in this picture. So starting at the very top on the right, you're gonna see a cornea, right? So the cornea is that transparent layer over top of the iris and pupil. And it's continuous with the sclera of the eye. So where the cornea and sclera meet, the corneoscleral junction, right? So then let's move a little bit more inferior or at least more deep. I think deep is much more appropriate. So from the cornea, we move deep one layer and you can see we have the iris. And the iris is a circumferential area around the pupil and that's where we get our colored eyes. And then we have the pupil in the very center, which isn't really shown in this image other than just the edge of pupil. And then other than that, we have the lens underneath. And you can see that there are a number of fibers that are extending to the edge of the lens. And this is gonna be very important in our ability to be able to focus on things because those little strands, those ciliary zonules are going to be able to pull at the lens and help change its shape to help us focus on different things. So then if we go back out to the accessory structures, if we look over on the left, you'll see starting the nose at the very top. As we move down the list, you'll see the lacrimal punctum. So that's that tiny little pore in the medial angle at the lacrimal caruncle. And what that is, is that's the area where tears are able to drain medio inferiorly. Because remember our lacrimal gland is supralateral. So the drainage down by our nose is going down, so it's going inframedially. And then we also have the medial angle of the eye here, so that's the area where our two eyelids or palpebrae meet. And what else do we have that we need to look at here? We also have some structures regarding vision, specifically down at the bottom, you'll see our optic disc, optic nerve, and also the fovea centralis. We're gonna talk about all that coming up, but I hope at this point you're comfortable with all the structures that we've already discussed. Take a minute to review these before we go any further if you're uncomfortable. The vascular layer includes the iris, 
the ciliary body, and choroid. And it's responsible for providing that blood vessel lymphatic drainage we just talked about, and then also regulating the amount of light that enters the eye, and then remember the secretion and reabsorption of aqueous humor, as well as controlling the shape of the lens. So the iris itself is going to contain a number of blood vessels, melanocytes for pigmentation, and also two layers of smooth muscle, which are called pupillary muscles, which we'll discuss in a moment. But these pupillary muscles are responsible for changing the diameter of the pupil, which is the central opening of the iris, and our pupil is going to be able to become more broad to take in more light, and it will constrict and become smaller in order to prevent too much light from coming in. Let's take a look at how that works next. The pupillary muscles are the muscles that allow the pupil to either dilate or constrict to address light coming in. So these are smooth muscle fibers that are controlled by the autonomic nervous system that are going to be able to allow more light to come in in dim light. So sympathetic activation will allow us to feel ready to see in the dark in case there is a threat. So it's a sympathetic activation that causes the pupils to dilate. And then the opposite is true. So when we're relaxing and it's daylight, we want to constrict that pupil so we don't see too, too much light. So our parasympathetic activation causes the pupils to constrict. So in figure 17.6 that you see here, you'll note that there are two different types of muscle, the sphincter pupillae and the dilator pupillae. And so the sphincter pupillae is circumferentially around the pupil at the innermost area to the pupil. And then radiating out beyond that is the dilator pupillae. So the dilator pupillae is the one that radiates out. And when they contract, those muscles are going to pull the pupil broader so we can take in more light. So the image on the left shows you what that looks like in real life. The sphincter pupillae, on the opposite hand, is going to be those concentric circles of smooth muscle going right around the pupil. That when they contract, then what happens is the pupil is going to constrict or at least the diameter decreases. The middle vascular layer of the eyeball wall includes the ciliary body, which attaches directly to the iris, and it stretches back posterior to the level of the aura serrata. And the aura serrata is really just the serrated, hence the word serrata, serrated anterior edge of the neural layer of the retina. Now this contains the ciliary muscle as well as the ciliary processes, and the ciliary zonule is the suspensory ligament that attaches the lens to the ciliary processes. So that allows for the change in the lens of its shape. In addition to the iris and ciliary body, the choroid is the last component of the vascular layer, which is the middle layer of the eyeball wall. So the choroid is the vascular layer that separates the fibrous and the inner layers, and it is posterior to the aura serrata. And in this layer, we have capillaries that will deliver oxygen and nutrients to the retina. Now, looking at the inner layer of the wall of the eyeball, we have the retina. And in the retina, there are two layers, the pigmented layer and the neural layer. The pigmented layer is going to be the layer that absorbs light that's passing through the neural layer. The neural layer is going to be the area that has supporting cells as well as neurons. So the outermost component of the neural layer will have photoreceptors, which are receptors that are able to recognize light. And so in this area, we have the photoreceptors that includes rods and cones. Rods are photoreceptors that are very sensitive to light. So they allow us to see when it's dimly lit. So when you wake up in the middle of the night and need to get a drink of water, you walk through the dark, but you can still see a little bit. And that's all you need to get you around in the middle of the night. That said, rods don't discriminate colors very well. Cones are photoreceptors that are great for providing fantastically crisp color vision, and these cones are specifically clustered very densely in the macula. They're especially present in the fovea centralis, which is also known as the fovea, and this is at the center of the macula. This is known as our site of sharpest vision, and it's where the visual axis is drawn. So the visual axis is basically a line from anything you're looking at directly to the fovea because that's our point of creating a visual image. Now what I have over on the right is an image here. It's just an additional tidbit for your interest. So we have a pretty broad view of color. Now that said, there are plenty of animals that see better than we do, but I thought it was worth noting 
that dogs have primarily rod-based vision. So that means they can see well at night, but they don't see color nearly as crisply or brightly as we do. So dogs are gonna see things that are kind of muted and pale. So as you can see, they can't really differentiate between red and yellow, for example. That all blurs together for the most part for them. So dogs having rod-based vision is very different than humans who have cone-based vision. When an optometrist or ophthalmologist takes a look at your eye, this is what they're looking at. So figure 17.7 shows you a photograph of the retina looking through the pupil. So first, let's look over at the left. We have two main areas of focus. So a dark spot in general is known as the macula. And so in the macula, we have no rods. However, we have the highest concentrations of cones there. So this is our sharpest area of color vision. The fovea centralis is that dark spot right in the very center of the macula. So that's the area specifically where we have that concentration of cones. So it's also, by the way, the same location where we have our visual axis. So what that means is that's where an object has its image implant on our eye. So that way we can make sense of the light that we are looking at. Now over at the right, you see a more white circular area and that's called the optic disc and it's a blind spot. And the reason for this is because that is the site of the optic nerve. So on the exterior of the eye, basically posterior to our eyeball itself, is the beginning of the optic nerve, and that's where it attaches, which makes sense because, as you can see, all these blood vessels are extending from that site there. So that is one spot in which we have a blind spot, which we'll play a little game with later on. Figure 17.7 shows you a cross-section of the optic disc as it's in sagittal section through the eye. So what you're looking at here primarily that's yellow coming from the bottom left part of the image is the optic nerve. And you can see in the very center of the optic nerve, we have the central retinal artery as well as the central retinal vein. And the vein of course is in blue and the red artery is obviously carrying oxygenated blood. So we see these blood vessels coming along through the center of the optic nerve. They enter the eyeball and then they branch out, right? So let's take a look at that wall now in between the actual posterior cavity and then the wall of the eye itself. So starting at the inner layer, you'll see here what we're focusing on in this image is the difference between the neural layer of the retina, which is the innermost layer, and the pigmented layer of the retina. So you can see that the pigmented layer is more superficial and the neural layer is a little bit more deep, meaning more inwards towards the center of the eye. So the optic disc, you, as you can see here, is right at the center of the image, and it's where our optic nerve enters the eye, and that creates our blind spot, because we're not able to have any rods or cones in that specific area, because, of course, the nerve and the blood vessels are in the way. In the neural layer of the retina, we're gonna have four different types of cells present. We have bipolar cells, ganglion cells, horizontal cells, and amacrine cells. So in figure 17.7, you can see the layout of these four different types of cells, both in a schematic on the left and also a light micrograph on the right. The bipolar cells are going to be the cells that will synapse with the rods and cones. So the rods and cones are the photoreceptors that then will synapse on the bipolar cells. Moving from the bipolar cells, the next step is going to be the ganglion cell. So the bipolar cell synapses on the ganglion cell. Horizontal cells are going to be those cells that are going to extend across the neural layer. So you can see these in the image here. And then we have also amacrine cells, and these are pretty comparable to horizontal cells for the most part. The role of the horizontal and amacrine cells is essentially just to either facilitate or to inhibit the communication that occurs between the photoreceptors and the ganglion cells. In other words, they're either going to help create a graded depolarization or not, so that way an action potential can occur or not. That is the main point. So they're altering the sensitivity of the retina is the effective outcome. The optic disc, which we looked at in a couple of slides previous to this, is that circular region that's just medial to the fovea, and that is where the optic nerve enters the eye. So because of that optic nerve in that location, we don't have photoreceptors there. So that creates a blind spot. So we're gonna play a game with the next slide. This slide here is figure 17.8 from your text, and it's actually a ton of fun to play with. 
So what you're going to want to do here is close one eye, just put your hand over it, and you're going to focus on the plus sign with the eye that's open. So just keep looking at that plus sign, and what you're going to do is move your head forwards and away from the image that you're looking at here. And you're going to notice that you're watching, you're watching, you're watching, and then all of a sudden that dot disappears, and then it comes back. And that's because for that split second where it goes away as you're moving, it's entering your blind spot of vision. Figure 17.9 shows you the chambers of the eye zoomed in a little bit closer. So you can recall from our earlier discussion that the anterior cavity is broken down into the anterior chamber and the posterior chamber. And then we also have the posterior cavity behind that, which is the vitreous chamber, which occupies the majority of the space in the eye. So when we look at this, we have the ciliary body and the lens that are dividing the interior of the eye into those two cavities, the posterior and the anterior cavities. The aqueous humor is the fluid that's circulating within the anterior cavity, and it has a composition that's pretty similar to cerebrospinal fluid. So it diffuses through to the posterior cavity and will enter the scleral venous sinus, which is also known as the canal of Schlem, at the corneoscleral junction where the cornea meets the sclera. It will also re-enter the circulation at the veins in the sclera as well. So it's an important component of interocular pressure because we're constantly making new fluid, but if it doesn't drain away properly, we can have increased intraocular pressure. And so normal intraocular pressure maintains our eye shape so our eyeball doesn't look like a shriveled balloon. Fun story, the very first time I did an autopsy, or rather the first time that I saw an autopsy, I was actually allowed to collect the aqueous humor fluid for toxicology testing. And that basically meant I was going to stick a needle into the eyeball and then extract out fluid and I watched the eyeball shrivel like a grape into a raisin. And it was just absolutely shocking to me how that happened. I think it would be to anybody. So that will help you to recall the aqueous humor is there to help keep that eye nice and round. But if we create fluid and it has nowhere to go, then we can have increased intraocular pressure. And the clinical consequences that, me, of that is actually pretty grave. So increased intra ocular pressure is called glaucoma. And if that continues over time, we have basically some slight changes in vision that will occur in the beginning, ranging all the way up to complete blindness if it's not addressed properly. The vitreous body is the gelatinous mass and posterior cavity which occupies the majority of the eyeball's space. So this is going to help to stabilize the shape of our eye. And the fluid in this is called the vitreous humor. So the vitreous humor is what is oftentimes sampled for toxicological analysis at post-mortem examination. So fun true story. When I was about 20 years old, I was an undergrad, and I saw my very first autopsy, which is what shaped my graduate education and changed everything for me. So this was a fascinating experience for me, and I was actually given the opportunity in my very first autopsy to extract the vitreous humor from the eye. So I was given a needle and told, go get the vitreous humor. Well, all right. So I took that needle and injected it into the eye and withdrew the fluid to obtain the proper sample. And I watched that eye go from being in a normal globoid or spheroid shape like a grape into a raisin. It was absolutely shocking. Anyway, I hope that that little story helps you to remember the vitreous humor when you're taking quizzes and exams. The lens of our eye, which is so important in allowing us to focus, is going to be held in place by a structure called the ciliary zonule. And we have lens fibers, which are in nucleate cells in the interior of the lens that are filled with something called crystalline, which is a protein that is super clear, and this helps to provide clarity and focusing power for our lens. A clinical correlation that's interesting here is cataracts. I'm sure you've heard about these frequently from people in your family. They're very common. And what a cataract is, is essentially a loss of transparent Pardon me, transparency in the lens, so that becomes difficult to see through and images become slightly blurry and unclear. So there can be a number of different etiologies for a cataract arising, but the most common is typically senile cataracts, which is just a natural component of aging. Now let's discuss section 17.4, how visual images are formed. Light energy is radiant energy, so it's going to travel in waves and it has characteristic wavelengths. We'll talk more about that coming up. 
But ultimately, what we're really looking at is light and how it bends as it passes through our cornea lens. So refraction is just the bending of light as it passes through our cornea lens. And you can imagine this in the same way that you can imagine if you stick a pencil into a glass of water, you'll see that it looks like they're discontinuous. It doesn't look like the pencil that's out of the water is continuous with the pencil in the water. It looks like it's off to the side somehow. And that's just because the light is refracted as it's passing through water differently than as it's passing through air. Our focal point is going to be that specific point of intersection of where the light approaches the retina. And then the focal distance is going to be the distance between that center of the lens and the focal point. So figure 1710 below is showing you the way light approaches the eye and how it refracts when it approaches the lens and then it hits the focal point behind the eye. So this has applications in terms of if somebody is nearsighted or farsighted or has normal vision. Our bodies are not perfectly symmetrical and similarly, our eyes are part of our bodies and therefore they are not always perfectly symmetrical either. So when our eyes have a slightly different shape other than spherical, we have what is called an astigmatism. And so this is basically when our eyes are shaped more like a football than a soccer ball essentially. So when this happens, what happens is the light that's coming into our eye, it's not going to be refracted properly because of that abnormal shape and therefore we have an image that we see being distorted. So there are different types of both glasses and contact lenses that address astigmatism separate from glasses and contact lenses that address just regular vision disturbances like being nearsighted or farsighted. Accommodation is what is when we have an automatic adjustment of the eye to allow us to have clear vision. So we'll have our lens either become rounder to allow us to focus on something that's nearby or it will squeak out and become flatter and that flatter lens will allow us to focus on something further away. We'll look at that in a little more detail in the next slide. Figure 1711 shows you how our lens works and changes shape to allow us to see both up close and far away. So if you look at these two images right away, I want to draw your attention to the point first. Then in the top image, you'll see that red dot that's off to the left, and it's close to the eye, and you can see that the lines coming off of it towards the eye are in the shape of a V and then they hit the eye. Now if you look down at the bottom image, you're going to see all of those lines approaching the eye and they're horizontal. And the reason for that is the little red dot that would be the object that the eye is focusing on is much further away. It's probably off this page altogether, it's so far away. So because of that, we have to have an adjustment in how we refract the light into our eyes so we can make sense of what we're seeing. So what's happening here is you can see that at the top we have a rounded lens and the rounded lens allows for that image to hit that focal point on the fovea centralis just perfectly so that, we, that way we can make sense of what we're seeing. Now in the bottom image, you can see that the fovea centralis still has that image hitting it, which is great. And the reason that it is, is because the lens is accommodating it. So the lens is going to then stretch out and flatten to allow the light to come in and be refracted properly so that way we can make sense of the light and image that we're seeing. Any image that arrives at our retina is going to be miniaturized, upside down, and backwards reversed from right to left. That's totally confusing. We're going to talk about this more in subsequent slides. But for now, it's important to understand that our brain is what allows us to compensate for this. Visual acuity is incredibly important for a million reasons, as you can well imagine. And this is essentially just clarity of vision. So a standard rating of good visual acuity is to have 20-20 vision. And what that means is that if you have 20-20 vision, you can see clearly at 20 feet what you should see at 20 feet. Now, if somebody has 20-15 vision, what that means is that at 20 feet, they can see things that a person would only normally be able to see at 15 feet. Now, the other way of looking at this is somebody who has 20-30 vision that's different, right? Because it's not 20-20, that's not better, that's worse. So that means that what they should be able to see at 20 feet, they see at 30 feet. So not so hot. But it's worth noting, by the way, that if you have vision that's better than average, for example, 20-15 or better, that actually qualifies you to have some pretty high clearance jobs in the military, like being a fighter pilot. Also, a scotoma is just an abnormal permanent blind spot. This is kind of an interesting clinical correlation 
And it can result from a number of different things, but ultimately it's from compression of the optic nerve, damage to photoreceptors, or central damage. Figure 1712 shows us why it is that an arriving image will arrive upside down and reverse from left to right. So anything that we're looking at is really constituted of a number of individual points of light that have to be refracted through the lens and then onto our retina. So as you can see in A, the little red dot that the eye is looking at has a line that goes through the lens and then you can see where it goes down to the bottom of the retina. Now, in B, you can see the exact opposite is true. The red dot is down low as opposed to up high, and so the line goes straight in to the top of the retina in a totally different way. But you can see that there are some lines that get bent a little bit and some that are more straight. And this is just the way the lens will basically make itself either more flat or more rounded in order to allow us to focus on things contingent on how far away they are. So now let's look at C. So in C, the eye is looking at a telephone pole. So as you can see here, in order for the eye to see something up at the top of the telephone pole, it comes in at a line that's basically coming diagonally down and hitting on the back of the retina, whereas the bottom of the telephone pole ends up coming in at the exact opposite angle from the bottom up. So because of that, the arriving light points are basically upside down. Now, if you look at D, you're gonna see that the same thing is true, but instead of being upside down, in this case, the image is reversed from left to right. So the red post at the far right end of that fence post is actually flipped. So it's actually closer to us when you look at this image. And the blue on the left, which is closer to us, is actually further away. So that's demonstrating how a horizontal object would be switched from left to right. And also, by the way, please note it is still upside down. Figure 1713 shows us the relationship between a traditional camera and our eyes in regards to how we focus on things that are near or far. So looking at the camera above, you'll see that the top camera is looking at a red point and you can see that the light refracts in through the lens of the camera and then the angle changes to be able to be focused at a point within the camera machinery to be able to make an image. Now the camera below this has something further off in the distance that it's focusing on because you can see the red lines extending from the lens are going out straight. So it's focused on something much further away. And so in order to be able to focus that, so we refract the lens image properly so it can be made into a proper picture, you'll see that the lens is actually pushed out further. So there's actually a mechanical movement in which the lens goes further away. So in a camera, we can't change the shape of the lens, but we can change the placement of it. Now, we can't change the placement of our eyes to focus on something far away, but we are able to either make our lens either more round or more flattened in order to allow for us to focus on objects at different distances. In the previous slide, we saw an example of emetropia, which was a normal healthy eye, which allowed for the eye to be able to have the ciliary muscle relax and the lens to flatten, and then that allows for an image to be focused on the retina surface at the proper focusing point. However, not everybody has perfectly normal vision and there are lots of shades of gray and our eyes, of course, are not always perfectly symmetrical. So because we're not always perfectly spheroid shaped eyes, we end up with vision disturbances. So there's both myopia and hyperopia, which is nearsightedness and farsightedness, which you've probably heard of before. So myopia is the image on the left that we're looking at here, in which case what you can see is that the eyeball is too deep. So that way the focus point isn't actually on the retina. The focus point is just before that. So because of this, if somebody is myopic, they're gonna see distant objects as very blurry and they can't focus on them properly. That said, they can see things normally that are at close range because the lens is able to be round enough to be able to refract the image properly. So the exact opposite is true in hyperopia, which is also known as farsightedness. In this case, we have an eye that's probably too shallow, or of course the lens could be involved here and it could be too flat. And in this case, what happens is as the light passes through the lens and is refracted, it doesn't focus on the retina. It would focus ideally at a point beyond the retina where it actually doesn't have any photoreceptors there to be able to receive the image. So as a result of this, people who are hyperopic are unable to see things at close range. And there's actually a type of hyperopia that becomes pretty common with people as they get older, and that's called presbyopia. And this is specifically because they have a loss of elasticity in the lens, 
as opposed to just having a different shaped eyeball altogether. Now that said, there is correction that's available for this. Of course, you could wear glasses. Of course, you could wear contact lenses. But a more permanent solution is a photorefractive keratectomy, in which case you have a laser shaping the cornea itself. So that way you end up with a proper shaped eye to allow you to see things with normal vision or emetropia. Now, LASIK surgery is incredibly effective. People end up with wonderful vision and oftentimes perfect vision after the surgery, but that is no fail safe for the rest of your life. You're still subject to long-term aging and may become presbyopic with age. Let's look at section 17.5, photoreceptors. Earlier in the lecture, we discussed photoreceptors in general and discussed how rods allow us to have vision in dim light and how cones allow us to see color. But now we're going to discuss this a little bit more in detail. So rods are able to detect the presence or the absence of photons. And again, that is light. So a photon is the basic unit of visible light. And cones are able to provide information to us about the wavelengths of those photons. So in other words, the color. Both rods and cones are going to be named for what they are based upon the shape of them to begin with. And they both have an inner segment that has major organelles within it. And the outer segment has membranous discs. It is these membranous discs that contain visual pigments. The visual pigments that are present in the outer segment of both rods and cones absorbs photons, which is the basic unit of light. And so when they absorb those photons, this is the very first step in photoreception. So these visual pigments are derivatives of rhodopsin, and rhodopsin is just a protein in a pigment. So the protein is opsin, and retinol is the pigment. Now, interestingly, retinol is synthesized from vitamin A. And while we have many months worth of vitamin A stores in our body most of the time, it is possible to have a vitamin deficiency of vitamin A. And as a result, your vision can suffer. True story for you. My favorite uncle, when he was in his early 20s applying to be a firefighter, had actually failed to meet some basic vision test to become a firefighter, and he was devastated. So he spoke with the fire chief who suggested to him that he should probably increase his vitamin A in his diet. So he ate a whole bunch of carrots for a little while. And lo and behold, I'm not even kidding you, his vision improved for the subsequent time he took the test. He passed and he spent his career as a firefighter and just a couple of years ago retired after having been fire chief himself for several years. So there's your story. Eat your carrots. Helps your eyes. <laughs> The general structure of rods and cones is shown in figure 1714. So starting at the bottom, what you see here is the innermost portion of the eye. So light is coming in, and first you see there is a bipolar cell. On the left, the example shows you a cone, and on the right, the example shows you there are two rods. So first, in the very beginning, we have light coming in with a bipolar cell that will then synapse with a photoreceptor. So on the left, we have the purple cone, on the right, the yellow rods. So the cone, as you can tell, is shaped just like what you think it would be. The inner segment on both rods and cones looks similar, but it's where the outer segment is towards the most superficial aspect of the eye where we can actually see the shape of the specific photoreceptor. So the cone itself, of course, is shaped like a cone, and it's in the ends in the outer segment where we have the flattened membranous plates or discs, and that's where we have our visual pigments present. So both the rods and the cones are going to meet up with the pigmented epithelium that you can see at the very top of the image here. And the pigmented epithelium is important for a number of reasons. First off, it's going to absorb photons. Again, that's our basic unit of light that isn't already absorbed earlier on in the process. And then further to that, the pigmented epithelium is going to be able to phagocytize any old discs that are shed from the tips of the outer segments of the rods and the cones. The visible colors that we see are provided to us by our cones, which are our photoreceptors responsible for color vision. So they will provide for us the ability to see blue, green, and red light. And so each of these different types of cones, the blue cones, green cones, and red cones, has a different form of opsin in it. So each of these different forms of opsin has a sensitivity to a different range of wavelengths. And each different wavelength is responsible for a different color. So you can see at the image below at the bottom of the screen here that we have blue cones having a wavelength in between about, let's say, 410 all the way up to maybe 550, whereas the red cones are going to have a totally different wavelength. They start somewhere in the area of 480 
and then stretch up to about 700. So it's the overlap and the usefulness of all of these cones working together, including the rods, that allows us to have very fine-tuned differentiation of shades of color and also of hue. Take a moment before looking at this in the textbook to see if you can identify the number that is present in the circle here. If you see the number 12, then that's great. That would indicate you probably have normal color vision. This is a standard slide out of the Ishihara color blindness test, which has multiple plates that are similar to this in different color combinations to tease out different types of color blindness. The most common type of color blindness is red green. And in that case, the red cones are missing. So people can't determine red light from green light. Figure 1716 is a two page spread showing you how photoreception works. The two parts of this that are most important for me to have you understand are what's on the far left and right sides. What's happening in the center is a little bit more complicated and a little bit more chemistry, but I'd like you to understand what's on the sides of this very well. So what we're looking at here, first off, is something called dark current. So when we have ions moving into the outer segment, then inwards towards the inner segment, and then more deep to the eye, into the outer aspect of the cell that is moving from superficial to deep and that's called dark current. So we start off with our photoreceptors having a totally different membrane potential than what we would expect of neurons. Neurons typically have a negative 70 millivolt membrane potential, whereas these photoreceptors are going to have a negative 40 millivolt resting membrane potential. So at that negative 40 millivolt membrane potential, our photoreceptors are going to continuously release neurotransmitters and particularly glutamate. So at this time, we also have that inner segment of the photoreceptor also pumping sodium ions out of the cytosol continuously. So then a number of things are going to happen. We'll have opsin activation occur, and then that opsin will also activate transducin, which has a cascade effect to activate phosphodiesterase. And then last, we have cyclic GMP levels will drop, and therefore our chemically gated sodium ion channels closing. So having those sodium ion channels closing changes a lot. Reducing sodium entry into the photoreceptor is going to reduce that dark current movement. So at the same time though, we still have active transport that continues to function and that's pumping sodium out from the cytosol. So once we have the sodium ion channels close, then our membrane potential decreases considerably and it moves towards negative 70 millivolts. So we have a hyperpolarized membrane, and at that point then, the neurotransmitter release that was occurring previously, just constantly leaking out, it just decreases considerably. So that decrease then is the signal that the bipolar cell right next to it has already absorbed a photon, our basic unit of light. So after it's absorbed a photon, retinol isn't going to just go back to its normal form. Now what it has to do is the entire rhodopsin molecule has to break down into both retinol and opsin in a process called bleaching, which we'll talk about next. So like everything in our body, after we've had any major activity, we have to recover. So if you think about an action potential, we have our graded depolarization, which will trigger an action potential if we meet threshold. And then there's our period afterwards where we have our absolute refractory period in which we cannot possibly have another action potential because it's just too spent, too exhausted. But then we also have the relative refractory period where we might actually be closer to having another action potential. So you can think of bleaching and the regeneration of visual pigments in a similar sort of way. So bleaching occurs after you've had your photoreceptor totally absorb a photon. So now we've had rhodopsin split into its two constituent parts, retinol and opsin. So at this point, we have a couple other changes that occur. 11 trans retinol will be converted back into the 11 cis retinol. And that is a process that is active and requires adenosine triphosphate or ATP. At this point, then the retinol can recombine with opsin and now it is regenerated and put back together and ready for the next stimulation. There's actually something clinically interesting called night blindness or nicolopia, and this can result from a deficiency of vitamin A. And I'm pretty certain that this was the situation that occurred with my uncle Michael when he was applying to be a firefighter. And of course, if you imagine that you're a firefighter, you probably need to have good night vision in order to see what you're doing in the dark. So night blindness is nicolopia and something that's very real to keep an eye on.
If you ever suspect that you have any difficulty with seeing at night, I highly recommend you go and see an optometrist or an ophthalmologist, and they can help you with determining what's going on. But for what it's worth, there is actually some evidence that shows that people with different eye colors may have greater sensitivity to light and darkness. Specifically, people with lighter colored eyes may be more sensitive, at the very least, to bright lights, whereas people with darker pigmented eyes may be less sensitive. If you've spent about half an hour or so in the dark, what happens is all the visual pigments that have been photobleached will have totally recovered. So at this point then, they're gonna to be totally receptive to being stimulated, and this is called our dark adapted state. So it just means we're used to being in the dark and we're able to see very sensitively any tiny little bit of light. So there is an example in your textbook that specifies that even a single rod can hyperpolarize in response to a single photon of light. So that's pretty crazy. And then on top of that, if as few as seven rods absorb photons at one time, you'll actually see a flash of light. So once you're dark adapted, you are extremely sensitive to seeing any light at all. Light adaptation is totally different. So once you're light adapted, you're gonna be able to see things just well and normal in the regular light of day because the rates of bleaching and then the reassembly of those visual pigments is balanced out equally. So you're able to continue seeing things. Retinitis pigmentosa is an inherited disease that's related to this. It's caused by progressive retinal degeneration. So eventually over time, what can happen is the person can lose complete vision and become eventually completely blind. But what's happening here that causes this blindness is that this inherited disease causes photoreceptors to be changed in their structure. And so that way the visual pigments and the membrane discs don't work quite properly. So we don't exactly know how those altered pigments are gonna destroy the photoreceptors, but the end result is ultimately blind, probably blindness nonetheless. The pathway of vision ultimately starts with the photoreceptors and then it ends with the visual cortex and the cerebral hemispheres. So essentially what this means is that any message that's sent visually has to cross two different synapses. It crosses one as it goes from photoreceptor to bipolar cell, and again from bipolar cell to ganglion cell. In the retina, we have millions of photoreceptors, and those will each monitor a specific receptive field. So we can have as many as even a thousand rods all passing their information through their bipolar cell to a single ganglion cell. So these ganglion cells are called M cells and the M cells monitor rods. The M stands for magna cells, meaning they're large. So these are large cells and what they do is they collect information about the general form or shape of an object, also about motion, and they're able to collect information like shadows and dim lighting. Just as thousands of photoreceptor rods will synapse on a ganglion cell called an M cell, we also have ganglion cells called P cells that allow for cones to synapse upon them too. So these P cells are gonna monitor cones to allow us to have some color vision. And in the fovea, the ratio of cones to ganglion cells is almost one to one. The P cells outnumber the M cells considerably, and they are gonna monitor and provide information about things like the sharp edges of things, fine detail, and of course, color. Figure 1719 shows you the way that light approaching the receptive field of our rods and cone photoreceptors affects the way the neurons will respond. So of our ganglion cells, we have both on-center neurons and off-center neurons. And the on-center neurons are going to be those that look like the circle at the top that's labeled A in the image, and that's yellow in the very center of that uppermost circle. And these on-center neurons are going to be excited when light arrives to the very center of the receptive field. But if light strikes the edges of it, it actually inhibits their activity. And then the exact opposite is true for our off-center neurons. Off-center neurons will be inhibited by light that strikes the central, sorry, the central zone. However, the off-center neurons are stimulated whenever light hits them off-center at the edges. Once the photoreceptors have done their job, now we have to look at how is that visual information processed centrally. So as the axons leave the ganglion cells, they're going to converge upon an optic disc. And when that happens, then they'll be able to penetrate through the wall of the eye, this is posteriorly, and then proceed towards the diencephalon in optic nerve two. So we have two optic nerve twos, right? We have one right, one on the left, and they'll both reach the diencephalon, 
but first they're going to partially cross over at the optic chiasm. So when they cross over, what we're having is just really the medial component crossing over, whereas the lateral component is going to stay on its own ipsilateral side. So that information then goes to the visual cortex, which is located in the occipital lobe. Optic radiation is when we have that bundle of projection fibers that will be able to link the lateral geniculates with the visual cortex. Our field of vision is how we perceive a visual image based on integrating information that arrives at our visual cortex of the occipital lobes. So both eyes are gonna see something different when they look at the same item. It's like two people standing on opposite sides of the road watching a car accident. Both people saw it from a totally different angle. So we have two separate views, but it's fortunate that we have our brain to be able to make sense of that information. And because we have those two different views, that's what allows us to have depth perception. So we're able to unconsciously compare the relative positions of objects in between the images that are received by both of our eyes. Our brainstem plays a very important role in visual processing, and specifically in our circadian rhythms. So our pineal gland of the epithalamus and the suprachiasmic nucleus, both are gonna take that visual information it receives and use that to establish our circadian rhythm, which is our daily wake and sleep cycle. So it takes this from visual information like the amount of light that we see during a day, and that in turn affects things like our endocrine function, our blood pressure, our metabolic rate, and digestive activities. Now it's time for the last section, section 17.6, equilibrium and hearing. First, let's look at the overall structures of the ear. So on the outside looking in, we have the external ear. And the external ear starts with the auricle at the most superior aspect, and down at the lower aspect we have the lobe, and then the tube of the ear going in towards the structures that are quote unquote the business end of hearing, that is the external acoustic meatus. So then the middle ear is going to be the site of most ear infections, which is called otitis media. And what we have in the middle ear are some structures of note, including the tympanic membrane, which is really just our eardrum, the auditory ossicles, and the oval window. Beyond that, we have the internal ear. And so housed within the petrous part of our temporal bone, we have the cochlea, the vestibular cochlear nerve, and the vestibule. So we're gonna discuss all of these parts later on coming up in more detail. Let's look at the external ear. We have the auricle or pinna, and that is the uppermost large part of our external ear that we think of as the actual ear itself. And what this does is it surrounds and protects the external acoustic meatus, which is the canal by which air and sound pass so that way we can hear things. So another name for the external acoustic meatus is the auditory canal. And this is important because the auricle will help us to provide directional sensitivity. You can imagine that when you put your hand up to your ear to cup around your ear that it helps you hear in a certain direction, that is because the auricle is shaped specifically to funnel sound waves in in a very specific way. Now moving a little bit more interiorly, we have the tympanic membrane or our eardrum, and this is a very thin and semi-transparent sheet, just a thin membrane. And this is at the end of the external acoustic meatus and separates the external ear from the middle ear. And just by the way, if ever you have somebody that you know have a ruptured tympanic membrane, which can happen from an ear infection. The nice thing is that this heals very quickly. Typically within 24 to 48 hours, you'll have a complete healing of that rupture. Also in the external ear, we have ceruminous glands. And I hope you're not all scarred for life by the image that I showed you before of that enormous portion of ceruminous secretion being removed from an ear. But that is just earwax, and it's a little bit different than our normal sebaceous and other secretions of our body. But these are integumentary glands, they're in the external acoustic meatus, and the cerumen that they secrete is really kind of that waxy brown thick material, but it's really an important thing to be present because what it does is it keeps out all sorts of foreign things, ranging from pieces of dirt and dust all the way through to insects or rocks or who knows what. Also, it slows the growth of microorganisms, which is clearly very important. Moving into the middle ear, we're now past the tympanic membrane into the tympanic cavity. So in that tympanic cavity, we have three small bones that are important for hearing, the malleus, incus, and stapes. The malleus is in the shape of a hammer, 
hence you've probably heard the expression something is malleable. That's something that can be hammered down. Also, there is the Incas, which is shaped like an anvil for hammering upon. And the steepies are in the shape of a stirrup, as if, if you were sitting on a horse and putting your feet in the stirrups. So in that tympanic cavity, we have this chamber that is filled with air, and this allows for communication with the nasopharynx through the auditory tube. That auditory tube allows us to equalize pressure on both sides of the tympanic membrane. So if you ever plug your nose and blow, and then you hear your ears pop, what you're doing there is you're equalizing pressure on both sides of the tympanic membrane. This is actually a very important thing to do if you're ever scuba diving as you both descend and ascend from a dive. When sound waves approach the tympanic membrane, it causes vibration. And then we have those auditory ossicles, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes that will conduct those vibrations to the internal ear. There are two small muscles that are there to protect the ear against noises that are extremely loud, the tensor tympani and the stapedius. So the tensor tympani literally tenses the tympanic membrane. It pulls on the malleus and that stiffens the tympanic membrane. And we also have the stapedius, which basically impedes the stapes. So the stapes is impeded by the stapedius. So it remo sorry, reduces movement of the stapes at the oval window. In the internal ear, we have a winding passageway called the labyrinth. So a bony labyrinth is going to surround and protect the membranous component of the labyrinth. We have paralymph, which is fluid that flows between the two labyrinths. And we have endolymph, which is housed within the membranous labyrinth. The bony labyrinth can be broken down into the vestibule, the semicircular canals, and the cochlea. And always remember the cochlea is our organ of hearing. In the internal ear, we have the vestibule. And this is kind of an old timey phrase that maybe your grandmother might have said, but my grandmother always referred to the vestibule being that's the opening where you greet people. So the vestibule here is similar to that. It encloses the saccule and the utricle. And here we have receptors that are responsible for detecting gravity and also for linear acceleration. Also in the internal ear, we have the three semicircular canals, which have an incredible role in helping us to determine where we are in space and time and our equilibrium. So those three semicircular canals have receptors that are stimulated by the way that we rotate our head. And also in the internal ear, we have the cochlea, which is our organ of hearing, and it contains the cochlear duct of the membranous labyrinth. And the receptors present in the cochlea are what allow us to actually hear. In the internal ear, we also have the round window and the oval window. So take a moment to take a look at where these are in the image and that you can see the oval window is right where the vestibule meets the middle ear and the oval window is going to be located very nearby. It's like right by the stapes. So the round window is a thin membranous partition and it separates paralymph from the spaces containing air of the middle ear. The oval window is going to be connected to the stapes by some collagen fibers. Our equilibrium is our state of physical balance. And so we receive sensation by receptors of the vestibular complex, both in the vestibule and the semicircular canals. We also have hair cells, which are our sensory receptors of the internal ear, which provide information about the direction and the strength of various mechanical stimuli. The anterior, posterior, and lateral semicircular ducts are continuous with the utricle, and each of those three ducts has a specific expanded region that's called the ampulla. So this has a gelatinous ampullary cupula and ampullary crest that has hair cells. So these hair cells have an important role in being able to detect changes to their environment. So each of these hair cells in the vestibular complex is going to have 80 to 100 stereocilia, and these are just basically looking like very, very long microvilli. But in addition to the stereocilia, they also have one extremely long extension, and that's called a kinocilium. And so if you look at figure 1724 on the right, you're going to see some very long strands extending from the hair cells, and those are the kinocilium. If you look even closer yet, you'll see that beneath the kinocilium, you're going to see a bunch of little small hairs sticking up. And those are supposed to be the stereocilia in this illustration. Figure 1724 shows you what the semicircular ducts look like zoomed in on big time. So what we're looking at here is we have the anterior, posterior, and lateral semicircular ducts. 
And as you can see, they're all oriented in different directions. So that way, fluid that moves within them in different directions based upon how we turn our head is able to create very specific information to provide us with an understanding of our equilibrium. In the lab, we show you a really great but super old video about the way that the semicircular ducts work. So this sketch here shows you pretty well the same thing as the video, but not quite as awesome. <laughs> so what's happening here is you can see at the bottom center, we have a hair cell that's at rest. So it's just sitting up, looking normal, minding its own business. But on the right and the left, what we have are examples of what happens if we have a direction change in the endolymph movement. So if the fluid by those hair cells changes direction, then as it changes direction, it's going to move that hair cell, which stimulates it. And then that creates an action potential. And that's how we're able to cumulatively understand where we are in terms of moving our head in space and time. In the utricle and the saccule, those hair cells are going to be able to provide sensations regarding to the position and linear movement of our head. These are connected with the endolymphatic duct, and that ends in the endolymphatic sac. So if you look at figure 1724D here, you'll note that the way the kinocilium is lined up is different from the stereocilia. The kinocilium is obviously longer and very important because it's considerably larger. But we also have those stereocilia that are kind of amping up in height towards the kinocilium. And that's because this specific hair cell is oriented so that way stimulation in a certain direction will stimulate it, but if it gets stimulated in the opposite direction, it will inhibit the hair cell's response. In the utricle and the saccule, the hair cells are going to be clustered in oval structures called maculae. And so the macula of the utricle is going to sense horizontal movement, whereas the macula of the saccule will sense vertical movement. Also present here is something kind of gross. It's called an otolith, which is literally an ear stone. And these are calcium carbonate crystals that are on the surface of the gelatinous mass. Figure 1725 shows you how those otoliths have a very important function. So if you look at image labeled one up at the top right, you're going to see that it looks like one of those purple boxes, which is basically a schematic of an otolith, is resting upon the gelatinous layer on top of the hair cells. And when we're in an upright position, the orientation is like you would think it would be, that the otolith is on top of the gelatinous layer on top of the hair cells. But if you look at image two, when you tilt your head posteriorly, what happens is gravity is going to cause some weight movement of those otoliths. So they'll pull in a certain direction. And so when that happens, that distorts the hair cell processes stimulating them. And that helps us to be able to have stimulated action potentials that will generate and tell us which way our head is turned. The pathway by which our equilibrium is sensed is through sensory neurons in our vestibular ganglia. So here we have hair cells that are monitored by the vestibular complex. And then we have fibers from the ganglia that are going to form the vestibular nerve, and that is one of the two components of the vestibular cochlear nerve. So one part is the vestibular nerve, the second part is the cochlear nerve, and they come together, both coming from the ear. And they will synapse within the vestibular nuclei right at the place where the pons and the medulla oblongata meet. There are four functions of the vestibular nuclei. The first is to be able to take that sensory information about balance and equilibrium and integrate it from both sides of the head. The second is to take information from the vestibular complex and relay it to the cerebellum. The third is to take information from the vestibular complex and then relay it to the cerebral cortex, which gives us information about our head position consciously. And then the last is to take commands to the motor nuclei in the brainstem as well as the spinal cord. The reflexive motor commands from the vestibular nuclei are going to be sent to the motor nuclei for the cranial nerves that are involved with eye, head, and neck movement. Instructions here will descend in the vestibular spinal tracts of the spinal cord, and that adjusts our peripheral muscle tone. It's also important that it complements our reflexive movement of our head and neck. The superior colliculi in our midbrain are responsible for automatic movements of our eyes in response to certain sensations of movement. 
And so this is an attempt to be able to keep us focused on a specific point so we don't lose our focus and fall over. So if we're spinning quickly, our eyes are going to make jerky movements. So in the lab, what we normally do is a really fun experiment where we put one student on a chair that's a spinning chair, just, you know, any old random chair that's capable of spinning. And then we have four or five students all stand in a circle around that person. And we literally spin you with your eyes closed. And so the student gets spun around and around and around and around for, I don't know, half a minute or so. And then we abruptly stop and all basically stare at that one student's eyes. And what we'll find is that their eyes will jerk back and forth from right to left very quickly. And that's just our attempt to be able to try to refocus after we've been totally disoriented. Nystagmus is when we have trouble controlling our eye movements when our body is stationary. And this can be caused by damage to a number of different places, but primarily our brainstem or our internal ear. So this can be tested by a physician or any healthcare practitioner when they look in your eyes with a light and try to ask you to follow that light with your eyes. Now let's discuss hearing. So the process of hearing is essentially just sound waves being converted into a mechanical movement by vibrating the tympanic membrane or our eardrum. The auditory ossicles, which are our malleus, incus, and stapes, are going to conduct those vibrations into the internal ear and then those vibrations further get converted into a pressure wave into fluid. So at that point, then the hair cells that are present in the cochlear duct will detect those vibrations in the pressure waves. And also that information then finally gets sent to the auditory cortex of the brain for interpretation. So what is sound? It's ultimately just a pressure wave and it's shaped like an S. So we call this a sine wave. And this consists of a region where our air molecules are going to be crowded together and an adjacent zone right next to it where they're going to be spaced further apart. Here's what this looks like. So the pressure waves, as you can see in figure 1727, are going to be spaced out where the molecules are further spaced apart. And then you can see those blue stripes where the molecules are pressed more closely together. So the wavelength is just the distance in between two, adjust, pardon, two adjacent wave crests or troughs technically too. And the frequency is going to be how many waves or cycles there are that pass a specific reference point at any given time. So what we do is typically just use hertz because this is the number of cycles per second that are counted. And that's probably the easiest framework to use to be able to determine the frequency of a specific number of waves. Pressure waves can be described in terms of pitch, amplitude and intensity. So pitch is going to be our sensory response to the frequency. Amplitude is the height of a sound wave. So a shorter sound wave would be considered lower amplitude and a higher sound wave would be higher amplitude. And intensity is going to be how much energy is there in a specific sound wave. So a high intensity sound wave is going to be very loud and a low intensity sound wave is going to be very quiet. And intensity is going to be reported in decibels. Table 17.1 shows you the intensity of various sounds that you're likely to hear in your life and what the corresponding decibel level is of those sounds. So a decibel level of 30 would correspond with something like being in a quiet library, just whispering to your neighbor to ask to borrow their pen. Whereas if you're standing in a large truck shop, for example, and there's lots of heavy equipment operating, you may hear something at the level of 90 or 100 decibels. And at that level, you can have considerable damage to your hearing if you're exposed to it for a period of time. The third column in this table shows you what the dangerous time exposure is. So if you're exposed to a 70 decibel level sound for a period of time, it could cause some damage to your hearing if this was a continuous extended exposure. Now that said, if you're standing right next to a rocket launching, for example, that's incredibly wildly loud and without protection, even just for a split second, hearing something that's terribly loud can cause considerable permanent hearing damage. The cochlear duct, or the scala media, is lying right between the scala vestibuli and the scala tympani. So the scala vestibuli is the vestibular duct, and the scala tympani is the tympanic duct. The hair cells are going to be present in the spiral organ, also known as the organ of corti. And this rests on the basilar membrane, separating the cochlear duct from the skull tympani. In this location, the hair cells lack kinocilia, kind of 
and the stereocilia here are going to contact the overlying tectorial membrane. Figure 1728 shows you on the left a schematic view of the cochlea, and on the right, you actually see a light micrograph image of the exact same thing. So on the left, what I'd like to draw your attention to is the fact that this is a spiral-shaped organ. So as it's transected, it looks like you've cut through a shell for the most part. If you look down at the bottom of this image, you're going to see the vestibular cochlear nerve labeled, which is cranial nerve 8. So the vestibular cochlear nerve, you can see here, branches off into two components. One is going to be the cochlear nerve going to the cochlea, and then the other component is going to be branching off and going to the vestibule to allow for our sense of equilibrium. Figure 1729 shows you another cross-section through the cochlea, so you can see the bony cochlear wall is going to protect these internal structures. So starting at the top, we have the scala vestibuli, and then beneath that, we have the vestibular membrane separating out from the cochlear duct. And then moving further down, you'll see our tectorial membrane and the spiral organ. And then finally, at the bottom, we have the scala tympani. The range between the softest possible sound you can imagine to the loudest sound you could tolerably manage to hear represents a huge space between the two. There's a trillion fold increase in power between those two. And so therefore auditory discrimination can actually be difficult to assess. But we do know for certain that young children have a great hearing range. They can hear both very loud and very quiet things. And with age, damage accumulates and eventually their hearing becomes less sensitive. So this happens through a number of mechanisms. One is that our tympanic membrane or eardrum becomes less flexible. Another is that the articulations in between the ossicles, that's our malleus, incus, and stapes, will stiffen. And the third is that the round window can begin to ossify and therefore also be less flexible. Figure 1730 outlines the six basic steps in hearing. So first what happens is we'll have a sound wave arrive at the tympanic membrane or the eardrum. Following that, the tympanic membrane is going to be moved by those sound waves and that displaces the auditory ossicles causing movement of the malleus, incus, and stapes. So that creates movement at the stapes, at the oval window. And so that oval window produces pressure waves in the paralymph of the scala vestibuli. Those pressure waves continue on and distort the basilar membrane as they proceed to the round window of the scala tympani. Then step five is where we have the vibration of the basilar membrane, and that's gonna cause vibration of the hair cells right up against the tectorial membrane. Finally, information about this, including both the region and the intensity of the stimulation, is going to be relayed to the central nervous system through the cochlear nerve, which is part of the vestibular cochlear nerve, for integration and interpretation. The cochlear nerve is formed by afferent fibers of sensory neurons in the spiral ganglion. And then these axons will enter the medulla oblongata and they synapse at the cochlear nucleus. This information ascends to the superior olivary nuclei, sorry, nuclei of the pons, as well as the inferior colliculi of the midbrain. Recalling, of course, that the superior colliculi of midbrain will take information that is visual. The midbrain then will coordinate our unconscious motor responses. Finally, the auditory sensations that are ascending will synapse in the medial geniculate body of the thalamus and projection fibers will deliver that information to the auditory cortex of the temporal lobe. Figure 1732 pulls together the complete pathway for auditory sensation. And keep in mind this is for auditory sensation, not for equilibrium. So in this case, what happens is stimulation of the hair cells along the basilar membrane will activate the sensory neurons. Then those sensory neurons are gonna take that information into the cochlear nerve and then carry it to the cochlear nucleus on the ipsilateral side. Next, the information is going to go up from each cochlear nucleus to the superior olivary nuclei of the pons and also the inferior colliculi of the midbrain. Once it arrives at the inferior colliculi, the inferior colliculi will direct a variety of different unconscious motor responses to the sounds such as turning to look away from something or towards something. And then ascending auditory information will go to the medial geniculate body in the CNS. And finally, projection fibers will take that information to the specific location in the brain where we have the auditory cortex of the temporal lobe.
Thank you so much, everyone, for your attention and for your resilience and working so hard at this course, which I know is definitely very difficult to begin with and it's difficult during a pandemic doing it by remote learning. My heart goes out to you guys and I want to be here for you. So please contact me if you have any questions whatsoever. I am here. I hope you know by now that I will make time to talk with you, even if it's only when you're available in the evenings or on the weekend. I will do whatever I can to make sure that I can help you if you need it. So please reach out. I'm here. Again, thank you guys. Good luck studying for your next upcoming exam. And again, contact me, please, if you have any questions whatsoever. Have a great week.